My name is Naomi Ojuma, and my topic is about neonatal neurologic injuries. This is the outline of the paper, and basically, um, like the title says, it focuses on neonatal, um, it focuses on neurologic injury to um, the fetus during the birthing process, during the labor and delivery process. So a birth injury is defined as a structural damage or functional deterioration of a newborn newborn's body, secondary to a traumatic event during labor, delivery, or both. Um, the incidence is approximately 0.08%, and thankfully, less than 2% of neonatal deaths. It occurs mostly during the second stage of labor when the fetus is passing through the birth canal. And like I said, this, we're basically talking about the neurologic compromise to the fetus during this process. Okay, so risk factors. Um, they're divided into three factors, three broad categories, maternal, fetal, and the delivery mechanism. Delivery factors include microsomia, which is basically um, birth weight greater than 4,000 grams, breech presentation, abnormal fetal presentation, prematurity, and precipitous delivery. Um, microsomia, like I said, 4,000 and above, um, results in a number of related injuries, such as shoulder dystocia, refractors, clavicular fractures, and hematoma, cephalohematoma, and caput secundum. Um, a birth weight of 4,000 to 4,500 grams is associated with doubling the risk of birth injuries. The risk increases by threefold if it's between 4,500 and 5,000, and it goes up to 4.5-fold if the, if the newborn weighs up to 5,000 grams. And this, this risk is independent of the route, the route of delivery. Oh, I was going to say something else. Yeah, so another factor, um, microsomia is, the leading cause of microsomia is poorly controlled maternal diabetes. Breach presentation can result in brachial plexus, brachial plexus palsies, intracranial hemorrhage, gluteal lacerations, and long bone fractures. Abnormal fetal presentation such as transverse compound face. Compound face is when there's the head is hyperflexed and presenting part of the fetus is the face. Can result in lacerations, bruising, and retinal hemorrhages. Prematurity and precipitous deliveries are both related to bruising, intra- and extracranial hemorrhages, and precipitous can cause retinal hemorrhaging as well. Okay, delivery mechanisms. Um, this includes obstetric instrumentation, such as forceps or vacuum extraction. So vacuum extraction entails a threefold increase, whereas forceps delivery has a f causes four times the birth injury risk. And imagine if they're used in combination. Sometimes they are. So um, it's used to facilitate the descent of delivery, the, de um, the descent of the fetus, but can definitely potentiate injury. Maternal factors include age, number, number of pregnancies, and pelvic anatomy. Extreme maternal ages under 16 and over 35, prima gravida, and cephalopelvic disproportion, disproportion, small maternal stature, all predispose fetus, all predispose the fetus to birth injuries. Okay, now so on to the actual injury. So um, the picture on the left. Um, shows this, this can, can represent the second stage of labor. So imagine, so imagine um, putting the factors, the risk factors that I've just talked to you about, imagine that the, the passageway is an inadequate, so you have the cephalopelvic disproportion, and the baby was big. You can imagine that it would be hard to negotiate the fetus through the, through the canal. So there's a little brachial plexus. And in manipulation of the head through the canal, you can have excessive widening of the angle between the head and the shoulder. And that's actually the proposed mechani mechanism of injury to the upper roots of the plexus, which is Erb's palsy. And when you have hyperabduction and backward rotation, that damages the lower roots and can cause the Pomkey's palsy. Prognosis of the injuries depends on the, act, the extent of the injury. So you can have stretching of the nerve, rupture of the nerve, or actual, um, you can have the nerve actually 
torn apart from its attachment to the spinal cord. And that's actually the worst prognosis, where you have complete paralysis of the muscles involved, of the muscles that the nerve innervates. You can also have total plexus palsy, where you have all the, you have C5 to T1 damaged. And shoulder dystocia can cause this vaginal breach to leave. You can also cause this, but to a lesser extent than shoulder dystocia will. Herb's palsy is a classic brachial plexus palsy. And it's going faster now, sorry. Excuse me. It's the classic brachial plexus palsy and involves the C5 and C6. You have adduction of the arm, medial rotation of the arm, and pronation of the, of the forearm. If the C7 root is involved as well, you have, you have damage to the wrist, wrist flexors, so then you have, um, you have wrist, wrist flexion, and then that gives you the classic waiter's tip posture. But like I said before, the extent of the injury determines prognosis. You, so you have damage to um, the biceps, and you can also have loss of sensation over the lateral arm. If, um, if, if the palsy does not resolve by second year of life, you have atrophy to the affected muscles. So, okay, so yeah, I have, um, so I talk a little bit about like case reports in the, in my, in my um, paper. If time would allow me, I'll just talk quickly about one. So this is an this is an herbs palsy case, a 22, 22, 16 grams vaginal delivery requiring forceps assistance. So a left a left herbs palsy was noted was noted in contraction with no contraction of the triceps, biceps, and deltoid, but good power in the wrist movement. So that means the C7 was not affected. Recovery was marginal at eight months, and an MRI showed avulsion of the cervical roots of by C5 and C6. By eight months, by 8.5 months, um, neurolysis of C5 and C6 was noted, was, was performed, and there's still no function of, there's still no function at six years of age. So it was, it was um, predicted that there will be no, um, that the child will have handicaps to the arm for most of its life. Comkey's palsy. So this is, like I said, this is a damage to the lower roots of the plexus, C7, C8, and T1. Um, you have loss of function of the intrinsic, intrinsic muscles of the hand and the wrist and the finger flexors. So you have like a, like this. Um, you can also have the um, sympathetic ganglion injured as well, and then you would have Hunter syndrome. You can also have this in the herpes palsy as well. So there was some um, debate the incidence of Klumke's palsy is very low, 0.6%. And there was some debates um, in the literature as to whether it actually exists. So some, some authors said that there's a sharp decline because of um, improvements in obstetric practice and um, a lower decline of vaginal breach deliveries. Others said that there, there are very few in the literature because it can be a late presentation of the total brachial plexus injury where the upper plexus functions have already resolved. And that was interesting to me because herpes palsy is actually more common than Klumke's, but it resolves more quicker than Klumke's. So at, at, year, at first year of age, 90% of herpes palsy has resolved, but only 40% of Klumke's resolves at that age. Facial nerve palsy, you have pressure on the forceps pressure of the forceps blades on the nerve trunk as it leaves the stylomastoid foramen or as it crosses the ramus of the mandible. So the baby presents with um, asymmetry of the face. When they're crying, one side, of the, one side of the face does not participate, as you can see here. And the first sign is failure to close the affected, the affected eye of the affected side. Prognosis is usually good. Intracranial hemorrhage. So um, this is not this is not from prematurity. This is from trauma to during the birth process. Most of the bleeding is of the venous origin. Mostly the um, small vessels across the, the course along the tentorium. You can also have intracerebellar hemorrhage, which is the picture here, and that's almost always due to birth trauma. Epidural bleeds are not as common because Apparently, the meningeal artery is not yet encased within the bone, 
and so freely moves away from the from displacement of the skull. And excessive molding can cause subdural hemorrhage. Spinal cord, spinal cord dis, um, injury. During breach deliveries, the spinal cord can be torn, usually in the upper thoracic region as a result of elongation of the vertebral column due to traction. So almost, almost the same way as brachial plexus injuries occur, um, especially when there's um, difficulty delivering the head. Ex there can be extensive hemorrhage and that can cause pressure on the medulla and phrenic nerve, resulting in difficulty in resuscitation and even death sometimes. Um, when there is just injury to the spinal cord itself, there is complete paralysis of the muscles, uh, of the muscles of the trunk and lower extremities, along with sensation of these areas. So this, this is not um, very good prognosis. At most times, at the end of the day, you're dealing with trying to um, prevent infections from occurring. So this is um, a picture of spinal cord injury. So this is actually a hematoma inside the spinal cord, not in, in the cranium. Um, so the um, A shows hemorrhage and edema of and a posterior epidural hemorrhage extending from C5 into the thoracic region, and B and C just shows the axial um, representation showing the circumferential spinal epidural hemorrhage. Another um, picture of spinal cord injury. So lower thoracic le le lesions will lead to flaccid paralysis of the lower extremities and bowel and bladder dysfunction. That's why I said most times you're trying to prevent infection. And expulsion of, u expulsion of urine after suprapubic pressure confirms bladder paralysis. And you can um, try to localize the level of the injury by, by checking response to pain. So that is all. Apart from the fact, summary, neonatal neurological injuries, although a lesser cause of neonatal mortality, is occasionally encountered in medical practice, and um, clinicians should pay attention to the likelihood of these possible injuries. Thank you. Thank you.